I mean, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and come back. So right, it's, a, it's a good thing is it's an hour flight, so it's very quick. Yeah, so. And let me know if you're ever in the D.C. Baltimore area as well. Yeah, I can host you for a day. So great. Yeah, okay. yeah that'd be fun. Okay. <laughs> fortunate to have Jason Kalarai with us today. Um, Jason, I'll just give a short introduction, uh, got his PhD from the University of British Columbia. Um, he then moved to UC Santa Cruz where he was a Hubble Fellow. And then in 2008 he took a position as a staff astronomer at Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, he started out as instrument scientist for WIFC-3 and then he became the deputy project scientist for JWST. Um, and, 2000, and in 2013, he became the JWST project scientist, um, a role he still serves in. Currently, um, he has received numerous honors and awards. Um, some of his most recent distinction, distinctions are um, the AAS awarded him the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize in 2014. Um, he was named the Kavli Frontiers of Science Fellow, or a Kavli Frontiers of Science Fellow, uh, in 2014 as well. And recently, the Maryland Academy of Scientist, Sciences elected him as the Outstanding Scientist of the Year. So we're very lucky to have him. Thank you. OK, wow. <laughs> Okay. So, Kate, thank you, thank you very much for that. So, it's been uh, it's been I think five or six years since I was here giving a colloquium, and our group has done uh, a wide range of work uh, to understand fundamental uh, relations in stellar astrophysics that anchor a lot of interesting things that we can say about the universe and and the properties of galaxies. And so, in this talk, I'll highlight some of the work that we've done over the last five or six years um, that uh, that speak to this. And so this is a work by a lot of different people. I collaborate with a number of people, and so I just wanted to acknowledge their contributions to uh, various research projects that you'll hear about today. I uh, especially want to point out Harvey Richer from the University of British Columbia. Harvey was my PhD advisor, uh, remains today a, a very close collaborator and a, and a very good friend. So let me start today by showing what I consider uh, the most valuable diagram in um, astronomy. Okay. <laughs> So this is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Not just a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but this is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This was published by, um, by uh, Henry Norris Russell in uh, 1914. A beautiful diagram, remarkably complete diagram that shows the stellar main sequence. You can see, you know, these are the same stars that you can see with the naked eye if you look up. Um, you can see giants and dwarfs, and in fact it was Hertzsprung who actually a few years before that noticed that uh, stars that emitted light at roughly the same wavelength and also had the same parallax had very different luminosities. And so Hertzsprung coined the term giants and dwarfs to distinguish between these stars. And you can see examples of those on this CMD. There are eclipsing binaries, eclipsing variables on this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So it's just a, it's a remarkably complete diagram. So one of the interesting puzzles uh, in 1914, and it's very timely that I give this talk today because this was 100 years ago. Um, one of the interesting puzzles was a remark that Russell made in 1913 where he says, it is immediately conspicuous that one corner of the diagram is vacant except for one star whose spectrum is very doubtful. There do not seem to be any faint white stars. Okay, so interesting. And then he followed up in 1914 and again says, the single apparent exception whose spectrum apparently of class A is rendered very difficult of observation by the proximity of a bright neighbor. So today, uh, we know this star is, in fact, a white dwarf. And it's a white dwarf that's um, in a system that's only five parsecs away, known as 40 Eridani. It's a triple system where you have a white dwarf and an M dwarf that are orbiting a K dwarf. And so it's a nearby system. And so, um, you know, Hertzsprung's, uh, and Russell, sorry, Russell's first diagram also included 
the end products of stellar evolution for the vast majority of stars that had uh, this nice white dwarf on it. Now, interestingly, 40 Iridani is also a very important system uh, for, for other purposes. So 40 Iridani A, uh, this star, was the host star for the planet Vulcan in Star Trek. And, <laughs> and so scientists have actually calculated what the habitable zone is around this star and so where the planet Vulcan uh, must be. Um, as a final example of the importance of this diagram, a remark by Russell, there appears from the rather scanty evidence at present available to be some correlation between mass and luminosity. Okay, so wonderful. So in my opinion, this discovery launched the era of using stellar populations as tools to understand light from the universe because we could take these stars and start figuring out what their masses are and how those masses correl correlate with luminosity and color at, a, at an age or metallicity or whatever. And so there are plenty of examples today where uh, this becomes important. And perhaps the most famous image, most famous picture of where you could, uh, you could track this is the Hubble deep field um, that was taken several years ago. So this is a view of what the universe looks like through a tiny, unobscured patch of sky. And there was a lot of debate uh, what astronomers would see when we opened up the shutters of Hubble and took a very deep exposure. And of course, what we see is that the universe is teeming with galaxies with different luminosities, different colors, different morphologies. And much of astronomy today is concerned with interpreting this image, with taking the light that we detect from these systems and figuring out what the star formation histories are, what the chemical abundances are, what the mass to light ratios are, and what the chronology of these galaxies are uh, within the, the, the time frame of the, of the universe. And so if you ask anybody, well, what is this an image of? They will say it's an image of galaxies. But to me, this isn't an image of galaxies at all. This is a view of stellar populations, right? What you are seeing in this image are stars in these systems that are at the luminous tip of their evolution. And so if you want to understand these systems, you have to understand stellar evolution, the time scales of stellar evolution, and the color of stars as they go through phases of stellar evolution as a function of their intrinsic properties. And so put another way, if you take a look at the red light that you detect from this, uh, this picture, a lot of that red light is coming from stars that are in the asymptotic giant branch phase of stellar evolution or the red giant branch phase of stellar evolution where stars become incredibly cool, incredibly bloated, um, and they can dominate the infrared light. There are examples of, of galaxies in this uh, image that lack any new star formation, yet they emit flux appreciably in the blue. A lot of elliptical galaxies do this. If you consider the energetics of all of the sources that might be responsible for that light, the hot horizontal branch, these core helium burning stars are the likely candidate. So understanding the morphology of the horizontal branch and the time scales of stellar evolution in that phase is very important for interpreting that blue light. And then of course, in some cases like spiral galaxies, you see um, the hydrogen burning main sequence and you have to understand um, the, the main sequence phase of, of, uh, of stars as well. So in this presentation, what I want to do is um, try and build a story of using stellar populations to, to constrain relations that end up impacting how we interpret this light from the galaxy. And so three of the key ingredients to bridge stars and galaxies are um, the initial mass function. So how do we create stars? We have to create a bunch of stars. The color magnitude relation where we take those stars that we created and now based on their masses, we assign colors and luminosities at a fixed age and metallicity. And then how you evolve those stellar populations, um, which in, end up impacting future generations of stars, end up impacting how they end their uh, life cycles, and, and eventually what those phases are going to be in those post-main sequence stars where stars become brightest. So let me start by creating stars, and then I'll move on to the, to the next two phases. So the initial mass function. So this is one of the, one of the holy grails of, of modern day astrophysics. It's been one of the, one of the studies uh, in astronomy that have, um, you know, that have been published by many, many different authors over the last 50, 60 years. Um, the IMF is imprinted by the process of star formation. It's uh, imprinted by processes such as turbulence and, and fragmentation of clouds into smaller components, accretion that happens in the cores as well as the ejection of low mass objects due to relaxation and other processes. And so if we can measure the initial mass function and figure out um, its universality or whether or not it depends on other properties and environment, we can go back and constrain some of the physics that are involved in the star formation process. Uh, much more interesting for me personally is that the IMF also serves as an input itself um, in many different fields of astronomy. So for example, at the low mass end, the IMF controls the Milky Way mass budget. 
It controls a number of low mass stars and even substellar objects that are being formed. At intermediate masses, I'll show later, stars can lose 70, 80 percent of their mass through stellar evolution. And that material is then recycled through our galaxy. And so it's very important for chemical enrichment and gas and dust feedback. And of course, at the high mass end, the IMF controls a number of core collapse supernovae that are happening and therefore kinetic feedback as well as winds. And so the IMF is really the centerpiece of a lot of uh, astrophysics and ends up impacting many things that we try and study in astronomy. So how do, you, um, how do you measure the IMF? So this is my attempt at a, at a one-slide summary of 60 years of research on the IMF. So I would say there are, there, are, there are lots of techniques, but you can group most of them into four different bins. And so the first is you actually look at the distribution of stellar masses near the sun. This is what Saltpeter did. Um, so this has huge advantages. You can resolve distances from uh, measuring parallaxes. You know uh, what the binarity is among stars. Um, so you can get very high precision measurements of the mass distribution and just directly count up the masses. The, the disadvantage is that your sample sizes are often limited. So if you want to explore how the mass function might be changing at a given mass, it's very hard to do that in the local sample. Another technique is photometric surveys. This is something that was, uh, that's been transformed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The advantage here is that you can look at large numbers of stars out to much greater distances. A disadvantage here is you have to assign distances to the stars using a photometric technique. You're also exploring stellar populations that have different ages. Um, you can see certain types of stars out to different distances, so there are huge biases uh, uh, in play that you have to know and, and account for. And in fact, these two methods don't yield the same answer unless you apply those strong corrections. Nice paper by Krupa in 1995 demonstrating that. A third category of IMF studies, there's a whole community looking at star clusters and measuring the IMF from star clusters. This has a huge advantage because it's a simple stellar population. You see all of the stars, they're coeval, they're co-spatial, they're isometallic, it's very clean. Um, the disadvantages are extinction and membership are often a concern in the case of the young clusters. In the case of the old clusters, the mass function that you measure today is not the initial mass function, it's the present day mass function, and dynamical effects can change that mass function. So to truly interpret the IMF from, say, observations of a globular star cluster, you also need to combine it with a dynamical model, and that gets complicated. And then, of course, there's a whole slew of studies looking at unresolved light from galaxies and trying to figure out what, the, the, what signature the IMF is imprinting on the unresolved light. There's lots of different samples, different galaxy types you can, uh, you can look at uh, with this. But the disadvantage is it lacks sensitivity compared to the resolved studies. And of course, it's difficult to model because galaxies are very complicated and it's not clear what the appropriate population should be that you put into your, into your model. So if we combine all of these, here's a plot by Nate Bastian in a review paper from 2010 that summarizes um, a, a large number of the studies that have occurred on the initial mass function. So you're seeing the slope, power loss slope of the IMF uh, here on the vertical axis and the mass range that was explored in the separate studies here. And so most of the work that's happened above about one solar mass shows that the IMF is a steep power law with a saltpeter type uh, slope. There's some scatter there. And then as you move to lower masses, it's clear that the IMF is turning over to a shallower slope, but different people argue on exactly where that turnover uh, occurs. So OK, so what, how do we make a high precision measurement of the initial mass function? So in my opinion, the perfect population for an IMF study requires a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, this, this amazing tool that we have in astronomy, th with the following characteristics. So we need exquisite photometry that defines a single stellar population like hydrogen burning main sequence. So it looks like a globular cluster main sequence. Uh, we need the stars to be co-spatial so we don't have Malquist bias. Uh, we need a stellar density that's in the thousands of stars so we can explore a range of masses and, and look for turnovers in the IMF within that range. We want to limit dynamical evolution, so we want a population that's not dynamically relaxed and doesn't have mass segregation. We don't want to worry about evolutionary corrections, and we don't want any membership uncertainty, and we want low extinction, okay? So that's the perfect set of criteria for studying the IMF. So where do we get this? Well, I would argue that you can get this in the halos of dwarf galaxies. And so in the halos of dwarf galaxies, you have a nearby population, nearby dwarf galaxies, you have a population that's co-spatial, that's not dynamically relaxed. Exquisite photometry can yield that color magnitude diagram, and it's a well-studied uh, well population. So we explored the halo of the small Magellanic Clouds, the picture of the small Magellanic Cloud with the Hubble Space Telescope, and constructed 
uh, this amazing Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, so this is plotting the V magnitude F606 versus 606 minus 814 for the small Magellanic cloud halo. You see this beautiful globular cluster-like hydrogen burning main sequence extending down to 30th magnitude in the optical band passes. Um, these faintest stars here have 0.2 solar masses, so you're looking at very faint stars in another galaxy using this resolve technique. Our 75% completeness limit is 28.6, and we have about 5,000 stars between this mass range from 0.4 to 0.98 solar masses. So if I chop off the stars that are below my 75% completeness limit, and I chop off all the stars that might have evolved, given um, you know, stars that are older than, than 10 billion years, I get this beautiful, clean color magnitude diagram that I can now use to measure what the IMF is. And so what we do is we model the CMD as a set of input stellar masses from different power law IMFs. Uh, we fold those through an appropriate mass luminosity relation that fits that very nice and well-defined sequence. And then we incorporate all of our data selection functions into the analysis. And so the way the latter works is we use artificial star tests. So we, we use the stellar point spread function in our Hubble data to generate stars, artificial stars over the complete mass range that we're exploring in the IMF. We inject these stars into our images simultaneously, a small number at a time, and recover them. And then we subject those new images, those synthetic images, to the same analysis that we did to the real data and produce a scattering matrix where I know for every position in my Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in that data set what the incompleteness is and what the photometric error is. Here's what the incompleteness curve looks like for our data set. You can see we're very, very complete down to very faint magnitudes, uh, 28th magnitude, even down to 29th magnitude. We're well above the 50% completeness limit. And then the final method is you, you now draw random masses from your power law initial mass function. You populate those masses within your appropriate stellar isochrones to get their luminosities. Uh, you can deal with binaries by drawing a second star for a fraction of the population, and you can vary that fraction among your different trials. And then the key point is that for each mass in the input IMF, you're selecting stars from the scattering matrix if the magnitude of that star is consistent with the input magnitudes that you put in the scattering matrix, but then you're only retaining the output magnitude. So you're retaining the recovered magnitude that folds in your error and your incompleteness uh, in the data set. So when we do this, we can take our observed CMD and match it with the simulated CMD. So the panel that you see on the right here is the, is the simulated CMD for a particular choice of the initial mass function. You can see the two look very, very similar. If we repeat this experiment and do a chi-squared between these two diagrams for different power law IMFs, this is what the data looks like. The chi-squared has a clear minimum. That minimum is at about minus 1.9. And so we conclude from our study that for the stellar population, over this mass range from 0.4 to 1 solar masses, the initial mass function is a power law with a slope of minus 1.9, where saltpeter on the scale is minus 2.3, and the three sigma uncertainty is 0 0.1 in the slope. So this is the most precise measurement of the initial mass function to date. Here's a, an example of what the luminosity function looks like. The, the blue points are the data set. The black curve is the power law IMF. Beautiful fit over the entire luminosity range. This is where a saltpeter mass function would sit. This is where minus 1.3 would sit. So we can rule out those mass functions to a very high uh, precision with these data. Now, if you extend our study to fainter stars, because we did explore down to 0.2 solar masses, we see very clear evidence that this um, slope is, is turning over at low masses, but we don't have the lever arm and the leverage to measure uh, what, that, what that slope becomes. But this is something that we can clean up and fix in the future. So that's our punchline on the initial mass function. Um, the future for this is we want to explore how that initial mass function changes with metallicity. Uh, changes with environment. There are several reasons, theoretically, to think that the IMF does change with metallicity. A uh, paper by Mark Krumholtz in 2011 suggests that, that you could expect a factor of two difference in the characteristic mass for a dex in metallicity. And so we have a, a Cycle 22 program on Hubble this year that I'm the PI of uh, called the Metallicity Dependence of the Stellar IMF. And we're basically going to repeat the experiment that we did in our 2013 study for a different field in the small Magellanic cloud that has a different metallicity, right? Because we've done spectroscopic surveys of the bright red giant branch stars in the SMC, so we can tailor, we can pick a field that we know is different in metallicity by a half a dex and figure out if the IMF is, in fact, relaxing. There's some evidence that this is happening. This is a study for the Milky Way from John Bachansky, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is our data point. This gray band shows what we'll do in the Cycle 22 Hubble program. 
And then there's a few data points of ultra faint, very metal poor dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way by Marla Jiha that suggest that the IMF might be very shallow in those metal poor regimes. But these data points have very large error bars as well because you are only exploring the IMF over a limited range and mass in these very old stellar populations. So I think this is a great way to study the IMF and explore its dependency on metallicity, high precision measurements, and calibrate whether or not there's a slope in the IMF. Okay? So that's how we're making the star. So we have an initial mass function. Next step is uh, let's construct color magnitude relations and calibrate the color magnitude relations so we can take our initial mass distribution of stars and, and figure out what the luminosities and colors should be as a function of, of uh, the age and the metallicity of the population. And so this is classical work that was started by, uh, by Henry Norris Russell and, and Hertzsprung in the, in about 100 years ago. It was continued by Harlow Shapley. Harlow Shapley extended this by looking at some of the nearest globular clusters uh, to the sun and doing both photometric studies to build Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams of the bright phases of stellar evolution in those clusters and also doing a, a, a wonderful amount of work in, in using those clusters to say something about what our place in the galaxy was. Uh, next big breakthrough occurred um, in 1950. This is a part of Alan Sandage's PhD thesis where for the first time we were able to construct a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that extended below the hydrogen burning main sequence turnoff in one of these old globular star clusters. And so you can track the, the phases of stellar evolution and what the luminosities and colors are for a low mass um, hydrogen burning stars in the optical band passes. I'd like to show uh, another diagram of the same cluster, Messier 3. This is from Roberto Bonanno in 1994. I like to show this because as our technology increases in our telescopes, we can, of course, get much more sensitive and better Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. But this is an example of where our method of doing photometry has increased. So these two color magnitude diagrams are actually built on the exact same data set, the same photographic plates, but this is digitized photometry of those plates where a sandwich is, was not. And so you clearly see in this um, diagram uh, all of the different phases of stellar evolution mapped out in detail given the, the richness of the star cluster. And then, of course, in modern times, the next big breakthrough came from the Hubble Space Telescope where we could now peer into the centers, into the crowded regions of these globular clusters. And given the space-based platform, we could measure exquisite photometry of the hydrogen burning main sequence down to very low luminosities. And so here's an example of one of the clusters that we've looked at, NGC 2808. This is a cluster at about 10 kiloparsecs, where with the power of the Hubble Space Telescope, not only do you see this beautiful hydrogen burning main sequence, but you actually see three main sequences that are separated out. And those main sequences have a small abundance variation among the different stars that formed in these clusters. It's a groundbreaking result that suggests that these, um, these star clusters are not as simple as we thought that they were. Uh, but, you know, and, and this has led to a whole new branch of stellar astrophysics called multiple stellar populations, and people now find evidence of this type of uh, split in the sequences of globular clusters for most of the, uh, the massive globular clusters in our Milky Way galaxy. So I would say the state of the art in using the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the color magnitude relation is, is some of the work that's been pioneered by Harvey Richer at the University of British Columbia, where... Um, we take very, very deep exposures to try and catalog the entire stellar populations in a globular star cluster other than the neutron stars. So we have all of the hydrogen burning main sequence stars and all of the end products of stellar evolution through the white dwarfs. And so we've had three very large allocations of 100 plus orbits on the Hubble Space Telescope to do this. These are um, three of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams that come from those studies. Uh, Messier 4, the nearest globular cluster, NGC 6397 and 47 TAC. You know, this is the latest study that we published. This is from a paper that I published in 2012. You know, these stars at the bottom of the hydrogen burning main sequence here, you know, based on a mass luminosity relation are 0.085 solar masses. So you're looking at stars in a globular cluster that are right at the hydrogen burning limit. Um, all of these little kinks and wiggles that you see in the, in the main sequence are... Uh, you know, predicted by stellar evolution or, I, I guess, color magnitude relations instead or color temperature relations, um, hydrogen burning main sequence turnoff, red giant branch uh, phase by far, you know, even more interesting, this, this beautiful white dwarf cooling sequence in the blue part of the color magnitude diagram. So these are the remnants, the stellar remnants of the stars that used to be on the hydrogen burning main sequence above the present day turnoff, but now have exhausted all of their uh, nuclear fuel and are just simply cooling as time goes on. And so we can use these relations to define um, these color magnitude relations as a function of metallicity. There's about a factor of 30 
difference in metallicity between these three star clusters. And so this project has led to a, a tremendous number of papers on, on different fields in stellar astrophysics, dynamics, looking for exotic stellar populations, cluster space motions in the galaxy, all sorts of stuff. Um, in my opinion, the most interesting has been the analysis of these white dwarf stars. And so uh, we all know this, right? So a low mass star, uh, low mass hydrogen burning star, its luminosity and color doesn't change appreciably with age. Okay, so if you have a star in the halo, hydrogen burning star that's 12 billion years old, or it's 12.2 billion years old, you can't really tell the difference, right? It's the same color and luminosity. Um, a very different thing happens for the white dwarfs. The white dwarfs continue to cool and drop off like a stone as they get older because they can't generate any heat. They're cinders. They're just radiating away. They're stored thermal energy into space. And so these are three synthetic white dwarf simulated white dwarf cooling sequences at ages of 10 billion years, 11 billion years, and 13 billion years. And you can see the structure of the cooling sequence is changing by more than a magnitude in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is very easy to measure. So by simply measuring the luminosity of these stellar remnants, you can figure out what their ages are, which is a powerful technique. And I find this remarkable because Russell's faint blue anomaly in his first Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is, in my opinion, the most valuable star on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram to, to measure the properties of these stellar populations. So here's a, here's a punchline of how beautiful this works. Um, this is a... This is, other than Hertzsprung's Russell diagram, this is like the second best diagram in, uh, in astronomy. So these are two globular clusters. They're Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams measured with Hubble, superimposed on one another. The only thing I've done here is remove the distance and the reddening, both of which are well known. Um, and look what you see. The hydrogen burning main sequence stars don't look anything alike because these two clusters have a factor of 20 difference in their metallicity. And, and the physics of these stars depends on metallicity. The white dwarfs don't care. Right? And the white dwarf is so dense that all of the metals simply sink, and therefore they just pile right on top of one another. Furthermore, you can see that in the case of 47 Tuck, which is the metal-rich cluster, um, the white dwarfs are truncating at a luminosity that's about a half a magnitude brighter than NGC 6397. You can use that information through a full-blown model done by Brad Hansen to conclude that 47 Tuck is about 2 billion years younger than NGC 6397. If we put all of our data products together, we can make this amazing age metallicity relation where for the first time the ages have been calculated using a technique that's independent of metallicity because the white dwarf cooling theory doesn't care about metallicity. You can see uh, age metallicity gradient in this plot. It's very exciting because the most metal poor clusters that we're going to look at are going to give us our best constraint of when baryonic structure formation started in the Milky Way. We know that there are clusters that are older than NGC 6397. We need to explore them using this uh, technique. And the slope of this relation is telling us something about the mass merger history of the Milky Way because the most uh, massive objects that were also more metal rich are the first ones to fall in. So this is, uh, this is wonderful work. Unfortunately, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can't really extend this to more distant clusters. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, we can look at dozens of star clusters over a range of metallicities and completely fill in this relation using this technique. Okay, so that's what we've done on the, on the color magnitude relations. So what's the future of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? So I would say that the majority of stellar populations we've looked at, um, most of the work to date has focused on visible light imaging. Um, infrared and UV color magnitude diagrams, high precision infrared and UV color magnitude diagrams are almost non-existent. And so what we really want to do next is explore what the infrared and the ultraviolet color magnitude relations look like, similar to the work that we've been doing over the last 50 years on the optical CMD. Here's the expectation. So these are two stellar isochrones for a 12 billion year old population plotted in the visible optical band passes and then in the near infrared band passes. The morphologies of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram are predicted to be very, very different due to opacity effects that kick in in M dwarfs. And so the prediction here is that as you get to lower mass stars, once you get down to about a half a solar mass, the sequence in the color magnitude diagram is, is going to actually bend to the blue. So lower mass, cooler stars are going to become bluer in a J minus H band pass as you go down the sequence. Um, this has never been seen before. Um, and it's very hard to detect because the baseline, the color baseline here is tiny. This is going from 0.4 magnitudes to 0.8 magnitudes. And so you need very high precision photometry to be able to track this kink back to the blue. Um, 
This can be very important for stellar populations work. This kink is age insensitive. The turnoff is not, the kink is. And so it provides increased leverage to say what the fundamental properties of the star cluster are, right? Just do a test in your head. Imagine you're fitting an observed sequence with a model here. You can adjust your age in a way to compensate the distance or the reddening or the extinction um, to get the same quality fit for different parameters. It's, it's degenerate, essentially. You lose that leverage in the infrared color magnitude diagram because your sequence is orthogonal um, as you go across this kink. And so it's going to be orthogonal to the reddening vector. So you have a lot more leverage because of this kink to fit the populations on the color magnitude diagram and say more carefully what their properties are. It's also an independent test of stellar models to define the ages of the systems. And you have much more sensitivity to the total stellar population in the infrared because these cool low mass stars are much, much brighter in the infrared bands than they are in the visible bands. So to try and explore this, we did an experiment, again, with the Hubble Space Telescope to use the infrared colors, the infrared band passes on Hubble to build a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, a high-precision Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in the infrared bands. And this is what we saw. Okay, so this is our data for a nearby globular cluster. Beautiful kink back to the blue. This cluster, you see the sequence sticking up here. This is actually a sequence of background stars in a, in a galaxy that's behind the star cluster, a nearby Milky Way dwarf galaxy. So you can just imagine this sequence being pushed down um, to, this, uh, to this population. And so we've, uh, we've explored, so we published this, and we've, uh, we've now started the process of building the first infrared color magnitude relation down to the hydrogen burning limit um, using Hubble. And so this is uh, work by my postdoc, Matteo Correnti, where we've looked at four different star clusters that have a a range of metallicities. This is a supersolar metallicity open cluster down to metal pore, you know, Fe over H minus 1.3. Globular star clusters start testing the models that we have for um, stellar evolution models and isochrones, and also to calibrate this color magnitude relation that's going to be very important for future infrared telescopes. Here's an example of how well this works when you're fitting the stellar populations. So if you take the same Hertzsprung-Russell diagram at the same signal to noise, and for a given age and metallicity, you ask, well, how well can I measure the distance and reddening using the visible colors? These are the contours that you get in reddening and distance. And at the same signal to noise, these are the contours that you get in the infrared bands. When you start combining these data, because of course you've got the same cluster in both band passes for UV and infrared data, um, you get huge gains here. You can actually use this technique to get to sub giga year age measurements, absolute age measurements for globular star clusters. Um, by far, the biggest uncertainty in our ability to date stellar population comes from their distance uncertainty. Okay? So I'm really excited about the future here because the combination of W first, for example, is going to allow us to explore this color magnitude diagram, not just for star clusters, but also for field populations in the Milky Way disk use this kink feature to figure out what the stellar population properties are across different lines of sight. And with Gaia, the bright red giant branch stars are easily um, going to be targeted by Gaia to constrain what the distances to these populations are to a few percent. So I think the future with w first and Gaia for the infrared color magnitude diagram is very exciting. Okay, so now I know you're all talking about, you're all thinking, what about the UV, right? We don't have a lot of future tools that are going to look at UV imaging. So we've started a new experiment to try and build the, the UV color magnitude relation. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of hot off the press. Um, so this is a, a field in a nearby globular star cluster. Uh, it's a Hubble Space Telescope program where we took the wide field camera three on Hubble, which has both a UV channel and an infrared channel, and we looked at the center of the globular cluster in the two most extreme ultraviolet filters. And when you do that, um, and, we, we, and in this program we had 10 orbits, and so we actually looked at Hubble with a, with a pointing. This is about one pointing with Hubble. And then we marched that pointing around the star cluster to explore a range of radii. So this is about you know, five or six arc minutes across, right at the center of a, of a very rich globular star cluster. So normally, this would be suicide. You would never do this because in the center of the star cluster, your, your crowding is going to affect your photometric quality so much that you're not going to be able to achieve high precision photometry. Um, here's what the center of the globular star cluster looks like, right in the center. So in the ultraviolet band passes, the bulk, the bulk of your luminosity function in the star cluster is hydrogen burning main sequence stars, and the brightest stars are your red giants. But that's only true in the optical baseline. Once you move to the ultraviolet, 
those stars are dropping off like a stone. And what we find is that you can do high precision photometry right in the center of this star cluster. And so here's the color magnitude diagram for this field. Um, the brightest stars in the star cluster are the white dwarfs, right? So this is a white dwarf up here at 17th magnitude. There are some blue stragglers brighter than it. These are the blue straggler sequence. But all of your hydrogen burning main sequence stars and your red giants just drop off like a stone. So this is a beautiful way to measure hot white. And by the way, this star is 90,000 Kelvin. So this is a white dwarf that just left the asymptotic giant branch, lost its envelope, and is now starting to cool. And so this is a wonderful way to calibrate what the um, ultraviolet color magnitude relation is, both for the stellar remnants, which, which are an appreciable fraction of the flux that you see, the blue stragglers, as well as the hydrogen burning stars and the giants. Now the most exciting science result from this program is something that was published in Astro PH uh, earlier this week by uh, Jeremy Heil from our program. <coughs> so, so let's think about what's happening here. So these white dwarfs um, have been cooling for a very small amount of time. They just formed, right? So these are stars that were sitting over here as 0.8 solar mass, 0.8 solar mass hydrogen burning main sequence stars, and now they're half solar mass white dwarfs. And they've been cooling as white dwarfs for a much smaller amount of time than the internal relaxation time of the center of the cluster. The internal dynamical time is about 70 million years. So when you look at the spatial distribution of the bright white dwarfs, they look like 0.8 solar mass hydrogen burning main sequence stars and not like half solar mass white dwarfs. As you go down the cooling sequence, these stars have been cooling for hundreds of millions of years and billions of years. And so those stars now look like half solar mass hydrogen burning main sequence stars. So you can use the white dwarfs as a clock to directly measure the diffusion of stars in a star cluster due to mass segregation. And there's a great paper by Jeremy Heil on Astro PH with that study. In cycle 23 on Hubble, my plan is to repeat this experiment in different star clusters that have different dynamical environments and calibrate the diffusion constant as a function of the dynamical environment of the cluster. What's the third band? Uh, again, the same cluster, so the small Magellanic cloud is behind the star cluster, and so that's the hydrogen burning main sequence star in the, in the, in the SMC. Okay. okay, so the final step. So we've created uh, the initial mass function. We found a way to map it in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. We're, we're doing the first mapping into the infrared. We have a plan to do it into the UV. And so then the final step is to take these populations and evolve them and figure out exactly how all of the bright phases in the post-main sequence uh, region are evolving. So this is very hard, and it's very hard for, because of mass loss. Um, so the red giant branch and the asymptotic giant branch are the first phases of stellar evolution where stars begin to lose an appreciable fraction of their mass. And that mass loss affects all of the subsequent post-main sequence phases. It affects the luminosity functions, the time scales of stellar evolution, it affects the horizontal branch morphology. Of course, it affects the white dwarfs. Um, we don't have a good first principles physical uh, you know, estimate of what this mass loss should be. It's a function of the envelope velocity of the star, the luminosity of the star. You have to know what the composition of the dust is. Um, you could have thermal pulses that are, that are dredging up material from the core of the star and increasing the opacity and leading to more mass loss. You have to know what the dust to gas ratio is, so it's just very difficult. And so this is kind of the, the pathetic state of affairs in predicting what the mass loss should be as a function of metallicity in different semi-empirical and, and, mod, and, and different theoretical treatments. And so this black line is a popular Reimers formalism that a lot of people use. And so as a function of metallicity, the Reimers formula suggests that there should be little mass loss. So all of this is for a single star, a low mass star with an age of 12 billion years that's evolving on the red giant branch. And this is plotting how much integrated mass that star loses. Some of these relations suggest that as you get to solar metallicity and above, you're going to lose a lot of uh, mass. And so what I want to do is calibrate this and actually figure out how much mass stars lose. So the trick um, that we've employed, because these phases of stellar evolution are very difficult, they're short-lived phases of stellar evolution, the stars are enshrouded in dust, it's very difficult to interpret what's happening, is to bypass that phase of stellar evolution. The two phases of stellar evolution that we do understand well are the hydrogen burning main sequence, we know what the masses of stars are on the hydrogen burning main sequence, and the white dwarf cooling phase. So if for a given population, for a given star, I can measure both its white dwarf mass and what its mass was, when it was on the hydrogen burning main sequence, I have the initial mass and the final mass for the same star, and therefore I can make an initial final mass relation where I can connect the initial masses to the final masses 
And the difference between these two is the amount of mass loss that that star suffered through pale spin sequence evolution. So how would you do this? So of course you can look at a, a star, uh, you know, look at a random star in the, in the galaxy up in the night sky. You can figure out what its current properties are, but you have no way to figure out what its eventual properties are going to be when it becomes a white dwarf. If you look at a white dwarf, Sirius B, um, you can measure what its current properties are, but you have no way to know what the progenitor properties of that star was. And so the trick that we adopt is uh, to look at star clusters again. Um, remarkable test beds for stellar evolution. In a star cluster, I can simultaneously measure the masses of the stars that are evolving off the hydrogen burning main sequence today and the stars that are forming white dwarfs today. So I have a proxy for measuring both the initial and the final mass for the same star, almost the same star. Um, so we've done this in a series of open star clusters. These are four or five of the, of the richest open star clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. Open star clusters are great for this kind of project because you can explore a range of ages. And as you explore a range of ages, you're exploring a range of turnoff masses. So let's take NGC 6791 here. This is an 8 billion year old star cluster. So that means the star that's evolving today off the hydrogen burning main sequence is about a one solar mass star. So if I now go to the white dwarf cooling sequence, I'm exploring stellar remnants that evolved very recently from a one solar mass hydrogen burning main sequence star. If I move over and I go to a younger star cluster, NGC 7789, this is a 1.4 billion year old cluster. So the turnoff mass today is two solar masses. If I look at the white dwarfs, those white dwarfs came from two solar masses. If I look at a very young cluster here, a couple hundred million years, that cluster is so young that even a five solar mass star hasn't had enough time to exhaust its hydrogen supply and make white dwarfs. And so if I find any white dwarfs in this cluster, those white dwarfs had to come from a star that was heavier than five solar masses. So this is a great way to measure the initial final mass relation. Um, the trick is to uh, measure the white dwarf masses. It turns out that you can do this remarkably well with spectroscopy. The white dwarfs are um, supported by degenerate electron pressure. Um, they have a that very high surface gravity, and that surface gravity causes the bomber lines to be broadened. And those bomber lines can be modeled to infer both the temperature and the surface gravity of the star, and therefore you can get its size and its mass. This is a technique that's been cross-checked against independent mass measurements. For example, Sirius B has an astrometric mass because of its orbit around Sirius A. It has a gravitational redshift mass as well, and, and over an appreciable range of temperatures, these three independent masses uh, agree very well with one another for white dwarfs. And so here are the bomber lines um, in, in synthetic spectra of white dwarfs. So this is H beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, eight, at three different temperatures. And you can see the depths of the lines are very different as a function of temperature. If I superimpose on this a white dwarf that has a higher surface gravity, log G equals eight, you can see that the bomber lines are broader. Essentially, you've taken a white dwarf You've dumped a little bit more mass on that white dwarf. As you do that, you increase the perturbations between neighboring atoms, and you have more pressure broadening, so your lines are a little bit broader. If I bump it up again to uh, log G equals 9, so this would be like a one solar mass white dwarf, you see all your low order bomber lines are much, much broader than the log G equals 7. One of the interesting things that you see is that the opposite happens for the high order lines. The high order lines represent you know, transitions of the, in the hydrogen atom of outer energy levels. So as you're increasing these perturbations, it's the high order lines, the outer energy levels that are going to be the first ones to be destroyed. So if you can simultaneously measure the low order lines and the high order lines, you can deconvolve any degeneracies between temperature and surface gravity and therefore get the masses very accurately. Um, here's some actual data. And this is the, the crappiest, faintest, lowest signal to noise data that I've collected in this project. This is uh, looking in Messier 4, a nearby globular star cluster. These are six white dwarfs that, uh, that have spectra that belong to the star cluster. The red line is a simultaneous fit to all of the bomber lines in each uh, white dwarf. Okay? So putting this all together, we know what the masses of the white dwarfs are using the spectroscopic technique. We know what the masses of the stars are that are evolving to make the white dwarfs. And we've done this in a whole bunch of star clusters. If you put all the results together, you get your initial final mass relation. I'll explain what the dashed line is in a minute, by the way. And so this initial mi final mass relation is, uh, you know, this is beautiful. It shows that, that more massive hydrogen burning main sequence stars are making more massive white dwarfs. Um, and it allows you to empirically calibrate this down to very low masses. All of these data points at the low mass end come from our work in the last, uh, you know, five or 10 years, uh, where we've pushed to older star clusters and, and measured this relation for the first time 
over this wide mass range. And so what we've learned is low mass stars like the sun are going to lose about 46% of their mass through stellar evolution. I can get a citation for that in about 5 billion years. Um, intermediate mass stars uh, with uh, initial masses of a few solar masses are going to lose the bulk of their mass, 70-75% of their mass through stellar evolution. And higher mass stars, 5-6 solar mass stars are going to lose 80% of their stellar evolution. And so we've been able to empirically calibrate this relation. This is a simple linear fit. You can do more fancy stuff if you want. Simple linear fit to all of the data. And so now anytime you create, you create a bunch of stars and you want to evolve those stars to figure out um, how they're going to evolve, what phases of stellar evolution they're going to go through, how much mass they're going to lose, how much mass they release to their surroundings. You can plug your initial mass function through this relation and get the total ejected mass loss by that population. This has been wonderfully enabling for a large number of problems in, in galactic and extragalactic astrophysics where you know, often you have some information about either the initial state or the final state, but not, not the link between the two. You can calculate that. I won't talk, talk about this in more detail. So one of our recent applications is um, going back to what I said at the start of the talk about interpreting the light that we see from distant galaxies is related to this uh, phase of stellar evolution where stars become their brightest in the red part of the spectrum. That's the thermally pulsating asymptotic giant branch. Up to 50% of the bolometric luminosity of galaxies is dominated by stars that are evolving in this phase. And if you apply different evolutionary models and, and of, of AGB evolution um, on infrared observations of Spitzer galaxies, you can get 60% lower ages and masses depending on whose models you pick. So this is something that we really want to understand what the lifetime of stars and what the luminosities of stars are in the AGB. And so here's how we do it. So, um, so in, in stellar models, um, the atmosphere is very messy, right? When the star is going up the red giant branch, when it's going up the asymptotic giant branch, there's a lot of physics happening in the atmosphere. The star is losing mass. It's very hard to track that from first principles. The thing that we do understand very well is what the core mass of a star is as it's going through these phases. And we can predict that core mass up to the point that the star lands on the thermally pulsating asymptotic giant branch. And so the dash line that you see in this diagram is the core mass of a star from a model at the first thermal pulse. Okay, and this is a model from 2000 by Leo Girardi. Okay? Now notice all of the data points sit above that model. That's exactly what you would expect, because as a star goes up the asymptotic giant branch, so a star lands on the asymptotic giant branch, it starts going up the asymptotic giant branch, what's going to happen? It's burning helium in an envelope. It's going to start blowing off its layers of, uh, of, uh, of helium into its interstellar surroundings. The core of the star is going to grow from the enriched material, and it's going to continue to grow until the star has lost its entire envelope. Once the star has lost its entire envelope, the thing that you have left over is the white dwarf. Okay? So if you look at the delta between the white dwarf mass measurements here and the core mass at the first thermal pulse, well, that tells you how much the core grows on the AGB. And if you know how much the core grows, you can calculate what the luminosity is and what the lifetime of the star is on that phase. Okay? So here's our measurements. So here's the core mass growth. This is a new paper that we just published. The core mass growth is a function of initial masses. We see a steep rise in the core mass growth, peaking at about two solar masses. But note that we don't have any data points between one and a half and two and a half solar masses. And then we see a shallow decline towards uh, larger masses. So we can now take this core mass growth and compare it directly to AGB models. And this is what the results look like. So these are different um, AGB models that predict vastly different core mass growths over the same initial mass range. And so we can use our data points to rule out some of these models and to validate the ones that we think have a, a treatment that's consistent with our results. So if we just ignore all, all of that and we, and we look at our data, what we find is that the stellar core mass growth is governed largely by the stellar wind on the, on the AGB. The third dredge up, the third dredge up is a phase where you, you kick up carbon and oxygen from the core of the star and you pollute it into the atmosphere. That increases the opacity. If you increase the opacity, you get more mass loss. If you get more mass loss, you get a shorter lifetime. You get a shorter core mass growth. We think this is an effect, but it's a secondary effect. We find that the lifetime and the luminosity peak at about two solar masses. That's what the lifetime and the energy output is on the AGB. Um, here are some plots from our paper just showing what the thermally pulsating AGB lifetime is as a function of mass, what the total energy output is, and what the thermally pulsating fuel is. 
And as a final step, we take some of the popular um, mass loss relations and the AGB evolution relations in the literature, and we just perform some exploratory calibrations to, to bring them more in line with our data products. So our future work on stellar evolution and mass loss, the first thing that I want to do is explore how the, the initial final mass relation changes as a function of metallicity. Most of the star clusters that we've looked at in this initial final mass relation are uh, clusters at solar metallicity. And what we've done is started a program, a National Science Foundation program that's being led by, by uh, one of my postdocs, Jeff Cummings, um, to target star clusters in the southern hemisphere, because they happen to be in the southern hemisphere, that have the same age as the ones that we've targeted at solar metallicity, but with a metallicity, at solar metallicity, but, but with a metallicity that's at least a half a dex different. And so by simply comparing the mass distribution of the white dwarfs in those clusters to the ones that we've looked at at solar metallicity, we can calibrate how mass loss is uh, varying with um, metallicity. The second thing that I want to look at, when you look at that initial final mass relation, the highest mass data point on that relation was a single white dwarf that belongs to the Pleiades star cluster. That white dwarf has a mass of 1.05 solar masses, and it looks like it's coming from a hydrogen burning star that's about six solar masses. So standard stellar structure tells us that we should be making more massive white dwarfs, but we haven't detected them. And the reason that we haven't detected them is because of incompleteness in our studies. To, to measure that regime, the upper mass, um, the upper mass end of the initial final mass relation, you need very rich and very young star clusters. And there's a lack of those uh, um, nearby. And so we've created a new program, which is um, on Hubble uh, for cycle 22 that I'm the PI of, called Which Stars Go Boom? Okay? And the purpose of this program is to figure out what the most massive star is that will make a white dwarf. And if you know what that number is, then you simultaneously constrain what the lower mass limit is to a core collapse supernova. And that's a very important number, right? So historically, you know, we learned in Astro 101 that that number occurs at eight solar masses, that anything above eight solar masses blows up, anything less makes a white dwarf. That number is very poorly constrained. It comes from an extrapolation of an old initial final mass relation in the, in the 1980s up to a final mass, that's the Chandrasekhar mass, and then you just read off what the initial mass is. In this program, a Hubble program, we want to measure it. And the way that we're going to measure it is to, to take advantage of this ultraviolet Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that we calculated in a nearby globular cluster, but to now push it to star clusters that are very, very rich, very dense, and very young in the large Magellanic Cloud. And so I've identified four star clusters that have present-day turnoff masses of about 6.5, 7.5, 8.5, and 9.5 solar masses. And in each one of these star clusters, we're going to construct a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So normally, you would never be able to detect white dwarfs at the distance of the large Magellanic Cloud. But in the ultraviolet, they're so bright that you can do it. And so this is my scale for the nearby star cluster. This is what the scale would be if the star was in the Magellanic Cloud. And this is the faintest luminosity that a white dwarf could have cooled to, given the ages of these clusters are only tens of millions of years. And so through this program, I, all I have to do is is figure out if these star clusters have a white dwarf cooling sequence. Either they made white dwarfs or they didn't make white dwarfs, and therefore you pin down the threshold mass that separates white dwarf formation from supernova formation. And each one of these clusters has hundreds of stars because they're so rich. These are tens of thousands of solar mass stars. They have hundreds of stars, or between 50 and 100 stars, on the present day hydrogen burning main sequence up to their limits, like 6.5, 7.5, 8.5. So they would have had dozens of stars that evolved beyond that limit. And those stars should be sitting on the white dwarf cooling sequence if, uh, if, they, make, if they make white dwarfs. And so this is really important for, for stellar structure and, and stellar, stellar astrophysics because this threshold mass is, is fundamental. But it's even more interesting from the other end because you know, this changes the number of type 2 supernovae that are happening. Right? If the number of type 2 or core collapse supernovae that are happening between a mass of 6 and 10 solar masses is equal to the total number above 10 solar masses. So if you change this limit from, say, 9 solar masses to 7 solar masses, you change energetics in galaxies significantly, you change chemical evolution models, you change the balance between yields, chemical yields from high mass stars, low mass stars, all sorts of uh, exciting stuff. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I would say the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the work that Hertzsprung and Russell did 100 years ago, really launched an era 
of using stellar populations to interpret light from the universe. Um, I think we've come a long way. We've made huge strides in measuring fundamental quantities that, that anchor many topics in astronomy. This includes initial mass function of stars. I think I've talk, talked about all of these. Color magnitude relation, how it depends on environment in different wavelengths. Um, the chronology of mass buildup, the mass luminosity relation. Talked at length about the time scale of stellar evolution and how much um, stellar mass loss and feedback is going to occur. And I think we're, um, we're at a very exciting time in astronomy. We've made this tremendous progress on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram through the tools that we've had already. But the 2020s are looking like a golden age for stellar astrophysics. All of these wonderful facilities um, that are coming online are going to provide you know, very high spatial resolution, um, infrared imaging, um, great astrometry. A prime focus spectrograph on Subaru is going to provide incredible multiplexing of spectroscopy. LSST is going to be amazing for visible imaging over a wide field of view. And of course, GMT, TMT, and the, and the European Large Telescope are going to be amazing for you know, high throughput, high resolution spectroscopy, adaptive optics, high contrast imaging. So I think this is going to be wonderful for stellar astrophysics. All right, thank you. Starting with your last slide, there is hell in 200 corners, we hope so. Uh, there was no continuation of a UV telescope, yet you spoke about the UV, and that's the comment and the question that I have. Um, the F225 filter that you're using for um, red giants, bright red giants, they should be dead there, but they're not because there is a red leak. Yeah. And uh, had beaten me a few times. So how do you deal with that? Or is your diagram? How is your diagram affected where you are seeing the red giant and they shouldn't be there? Okay. So um, at the top of that diagram, there's some saturation that's kicking in on the red stars, and that's why you see that strange sequence. Um, F225W does have a red leak, um, and that red leak has been measured. Um, I was on the WIFC3 instrument scientist team, as Kate mentioned, and so we actually measured what the red leak is. And so we can calibrate out the effects of the red leak since we know what the red stellar population is. And we do that. So you're correcting it. Yeah, we correct it. Now, um, it's still, 225W is a, is, a, is a filter that has other problems. Um, you know, the positions of stars seen, positions of red stars and blue stars can be slightly different as seen through that filter. It's a, it's a bit of a mess, actually. So the program that we're doing in cycle 23 in the UV, we're going to use 275W, which is not, a, not as UV sensitive but it's a broader filter, and, uh, and it doesn't have some of those problems. So we're actually shifting to a slightly redder filter than we used in this first program because of some of these lessons learned. Um, Hubble is doing fantastically well, right? The history of Hubble is something breaks every five years. <laughs> um, but, but it's been five years since the last servicing mission. The instruments that were repaired on Hubble in the last servicing mission have already outlived their initial lifetime since before they broke. The new instruments that were installed in Hubble in uh, 2009 are still operating on the first side of their dual electronics, so you could always shift them over to the second side should something happen. Um, we have plenty of gyroscopes, the reaction wheels, the thermal blankets, the batteries, the lifetime of all of these things is projected to take us into the 2020s. We never know. Something catastrophic could, could happen, but we are fully expecting to do joint science operations with Hubble and JWST into the 2020s. And, uh, and it's been extremely scientifically productive, and I haven't heard anybody talking about turning it off, you know, given, given how long it's doing. So going back to your infrared color magnitude diagram, you showed the kink where the m are, and below that kink, it looked like your main, main sequence gets really wide. Mm -hmm. Is that a true physical effect, or is there many noise because you're looking at really faint stars? Yeah, so if you take, uh, it's a great question. So if you take the, um, the sequence below the kink where it flares out, some part of that is our photometric scatter. You know, as we, you know, that baseline on that color magnitude diagram is very small. And so even if our errors are, you know, percent level, 5% or 10%, it causes an appreciable scatter in that color magnitude diagram. But the, but the answer is we don't know, right? There are molecular opacities at play that are causing that sequence to bend back to the blue. And I think one of the next steps here is to do infrared spectroscopy 
of stars below that kink and figure out what the different bands look like in those in those you know in the infrared range that are causing those effects. And you might find that the bluer stars below the kink versus the redder stars have different different molecules that are playing an important effect in that scatter. And I think we can do that now. There are there are you know infrared spectrographs like MOSFIRE on Keck and um, you know Flamingos 2 on Gemini that you can use in, in multi-object mode and get spectra for a whole bunch of stars going across at a fixed luminosity and then you just co-add the spectra. And you just have to move to the outskirts of the star clusters where crowding's not gonna be a problem, but I think it's completely doable. Yeah, early on you showed a, a very nice CMD of the globular clusters that had uh, multiple main sequences, you said. I don't know if you can show that. Yeah, I can find it. Yeah. So that was the prototype. That was the first one, NGC 2808. Uh, but now, um, you know, this has been found in a lot of a lot of different globular clusters. So when you look at the uh, different main sequences, I imagine the offsets due to metallicity, right? Well, so so <laughs> so we've done spectroscopy. I mean, people have done spectroscopy on these sequences, and the the stars that are bluer are the more metal rich in terms of the iron. More metal rich. They're the more metal rich in terms of iron. So this is believed to be. I mean, one of the theories is that it's caused by helium abundance variations. Um, so the, the turnoffs, the, the masses for different populations in these sequences would actually be different at, the, at a fixed age. And so it's believed to be pollution early in the cluster's environment that has, um, that has affected subsequent generations of stars. So the, I mean, you essentially get the first AGB stars evolving, producing winds, and affecting subsequent, subsequent generations of stars. But I was wondering if that could be interpreted as burst of star formation. Um, it could be. Uh, when we look at the Magellanic Cloud clusters that are uh, more younger, right? So say, say you had multiple bursts of star formation uh, separated by a few hundred million years. Well, in a cluster that's 12 billion years old, you can't really tell, right? A 12.1 and a 12 billion year old turnoff looks the same. When we look at massive globular clusters in the Magellanic Clouds that are younger, that are one and a half billion years or one billion years, you actually see evidence of multiple splits on the main sequence turnoff because you can tell the difference between a 1 billion year and a 1.2 billion year population. So it's possible that you had you know, boom, boom, boom in the cluster's history that created multiple bursts, at least in the case of the Magellanic Cloud clusters. It's unclear if that's happening here in the Lambert clusters of our galaxy. Okay. Because if it was that these were due to bursts, you could tell from the density of the points on the, on the CMD mm -hmm. you know, how much gas was left over. Yeah, right. was it, First a few stars forming, then a big burst, and yeah. then vice versa. So when you, when you start doing that, you run into challenges. The data don't look like they're making sense. <laughs> Jason, are there any constraints on the IMF differences in these different sequences? It would be tough to unravel, but it would be very interesting. Yeah, not, that I'm, not, not that I'm aware of. And, and you're, you showed an IMF versus um, mass range in, early, in an earlier slide. What, can you go back to that slide? Um, yeah, sure. For this one somewhere. Uh, this one? No. Uh, IMF versus mass. Oh, oh, the, this one? Yes, yeah, the, the, the slope versus mass. Right. Um, it's, an, it's, it's a very interesting question what it's doing is it really as flat as it appears above one solar mass? Right. Are there significant evidence? Is there any evidence for changes of slope with with metallicity again, in particular? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting for the neutron star populations. We we see the X-ray binaries in metal-rich clusters very preferentially. Mm -hmm. That continues to be a debate as to whether that's an IMF effect oh, okay. or a binary evolution effect. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this 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 part this parameter space is is hard to constrain with most of the types of star clusters that I've talked about, but it's a it's a different problem. So there's a paper that's going to be coming out by um, by Dan Weiss, a uh, postdoc that's working on the FAT survey that's looking at the IMF in the Andromeda Spiral Galaxies disk. We have this exquisite Hubble Space Telescope uh, multi field imaging program in Andromeda. And, um, and he's got an IMF, but there again, you're looking at almost the same metallicity throughout the field. So, so it's an interesting question. I don't know how you'd measure that, you know, with a high precision test. I just wanted to ask, 
wondering about um, what is the actual time scale from the turn off to becoming a white or in terms of the actual age of the star? So we actually count, so right, so I skipped over that. So when you, when you measure the initial mass for a given white dwarf, you actually account for that. So what you know is when you measure a white dwarf from the spectrum, you get a lot of, this is why, you know, if there's one parameter that I could, um, I could know for, for some star, it would be its distance, right? If I could know something's distance, I could interpret its light much better. For a white dwarf, the reason I love studying these objects is based on the spectrum alone, you can get the surface gravity, the temperature, um, the mass, uh, the cooling age of the star, how long it's been cooling for, and um, its luminosity. And so when we do the spectroscopy of the white dwarfs, we get a cooling age, and that's how long the star has been cooling for, from the tip of the asymptotic giant branch down to its present luminosity. And then we know what the star cluster age is. So if we subtract the cooling age from the star cluster age, we get the lifetime of the progenitor up to the tip of the AGB, and that's what we use to get the initial mass. Yeah. And so what is that time scale? It depends. For high mass stars, it's very quick. You know, it can be tens of millions of years. For low mass stars, it's, it's much longer. 